Okay, so uh, I think we can start. So there's already a uh, few people online and uh, in in the in the room. So welcome to this uh, seminar, uh, the uh, Severo Choa uh, Research Seminar of Women in BSc. Uh, the, we have the pleasure. I have the pleasure to introduce Maria Anciana. So uh, she is associate uh, professor at the Department of Environmental Health uh, Science in Columbia University Mailman School of, of Public Health. And he is uh, doing a sabbatical uh, here in Barcelona at uh, IS Global. And uh, yeah, today she will uh, talk about air pollution and neurodegeneration. And uh, yeah, we are quite happy to have you here today. And just for uh, informing you after the talk, uh, those of you that would like to discuss more in depth a specific topic with her we will still have uh, an extra hour here available and uh, yeah uh, so i think that uh, yeah with uh, with this i uh, course is your uh, marianthi gracias um hello everyone i'm very excited to be here thank you very much for the uh, introduction lovely introduction and the invitation and the mini tour the, the facilities here are, are great so <laughs> i'm really enjoying this so far uh, so this is um, this presentation is about air pollution and neurogeneration, and that's uh, a, a small part of of what we're doing at the group. Uh, so after this presentation, uh, if you have any questions either about this topic or in general about air pollution and health effects, please let me know, and I'm happy to talk about anything. Um, so. Okay, so this is a brief outline of my presentation today, um, a brief introduction, and then we'll go into specific studies looking at air pollution, specific pollutants, and different uh, neurodegenerative outcomes. So the most notorious air pollution episode, and I'm sorry if you already know all of this, and it's a bit repetitive, but I didn't know exactly the audience, so it's a little bit of everything. So not the first one, but definitely the most notorious episode, air pollution episode, is the one called London Fog during a week in December of 1952 in London because of adverse weather condition, basically no wind and um, very and cold. So very high uh, emissions concentrations skyrocketed. It was impossible to even see. Um, and if you watch The Crown, I don't know if you watch The Crown, I don't know how you feel about the series, but the episode on London Fog is phenomenal. <laughs> I think it's in the first season. Um, so, but what we found out right afterwards, and these papers came out a month after that episode. So the first graph here shows for the month of August that year and the month of December, which is when the London fog uh, happened, these are the total number of emergency admissions. And as you can see, you know, they go up and down, of course, but this huge spike here is exactly the week of the London fog. And then this is total admissions. They also broke the admissions down by category. And these are respiratory admissions and these are cardiovascular admissions here. And they didn't see much uh, with, you know, surgeries and uh, cerebral hemorrhage, et cetera, but it's cardiovascular and respiratory uh, bumped up quite a bit. And this is death. So we, the deaths even uh, went up and remained slightly elevated following the event. So even from 1953, we have some pretty strong evidence that air pollution can be harmful to, to health. And this is a meta-analysis from 1987 showing basically the same thing, but in one graph, in, in, in a single graph showing smoke, total smoke and uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide going up and number of deaths going up and remaining up with a slight slag. So there is a lot of evidence, whoop, going the wrong way, Oh, so before I talk more about um, the health effects of air pollution, I'll talk a little bit very briefly about particulate matter, PM. This is what I'll be focusing mostly during the presentation today. So PM 2.5 is a mixture in it by itself, even though we measure total concentrations, mass per, per volume. Uh, PM is a complex air mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets, including acids, so organics, metals, soil, dust particles, it can either be primarily emitted in the atmosphere, uh, combustion, traffic, industrial processes, wildfires, we see huge peaks, but it can also be secondarily formed in the atmosphere through a series of, of complex uh, chemical reactions in the presence of sunlight and temperature. 
And depending on location and time of the year, actually the secondarily formed particles might contribute more to the total concentration than the primarily, uh, primary limited, um, primarily emitted ones. So for health studies, we usually group them into, well, not only for health studies, but into size dependent uh, categories. Inhalable coarse particles are the, or PM10 are particles that we can breathe in, but because they're somewhat larger, they tend to stay more in the upper airways. And then we have fine particles or PM2.5, which is what I will be focusing mostly in this talk. And these are smaller particles that can penetrate deep into the lung. They induce uh, local inflammation and oxidative stress there, then then goes systemic. So that's how air pollution leads. That's the main two pathways that air pollution leads to pathogenesis is through the systemic inflammation and systemic oxidative stress, which is why we see so many associations with pretty much most outcomes. Because any outcome, any system, any organ that is affected by inflammation and oxidative stress can be impacted by exposure to air pollution. So there, you know, the field of air pollution epidemiology has exploded. There are thousands, probably millions of studies showing that air pollution can cause. Now for most of these, we know the associations are actually causal, all cause and non-accidental mortality, cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, respiratory mortality and morbidity, pregnancy and birth outcomes, uh, and PM2.5 is a recognized uh, carcinogen and diesel exhaust as well. But this talk is all about neurodegeneration. So sometime in the late 2000s, um, so not so recent, but studies started showing up, uh, showing, demonstrating a link between air pollution and effects on our nervous system. And even though this graph is now a bit old in 2009, I really like it. And we know much more about the, the pathways now. I really like it because, you know, they haven't published a nicer one since. So <laughs> the way we can, um, the way that air pollution can impact our nervous system is through direct mechanisms. For example, soluble compounds or pollutants can reach the brain or ultra fine particles that are a small subset. Well, it depends if you're thinking months concentration or number concentration uh, of PM 2.5, but those are nano size, they're tiny. They can go actually directly to the brain through the olfactory bulb. There are studies showing metal particles that have been deposited in our brains, uh, but also through peripheral mechanisms, as I said, uh, oxidative, local oxidative stress in the lungs and local inflammation goes systemic that then can result in neuroinflammation that then, if, if consistent over time, can lead to impacts in the nervous system. So in this presentation specifically, I will focus on three neurodegenerative outcomes, and their neurodegenerative means happening later in the life. Um, air pollution has also, parenthesis, been associated with many neurodevelopmental outcomes, so consistent links with uh, attention, ADHD, attention deficits, and hyperactivity disorder. We there, we there are studies showing that it's causally related with autism, for example. So if you're interested in that, ask me later in this presentation. I'll talk, focus on the other side of life. So we'll be talking a lot about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. What's very important here is that we don't know the exact onset of any of these diseases. We know when the symptoms start or when we start recognizing the symptoms and we know when the diagnosis comes, but we don't exactly know the on onset. And for some of these, for Parkinson's and ALS, I don't necessarily, I'm not sure about Alzheimer's, but we have studies showing early, early signs, not necessarily demonstrated symptoms, but early signs even in adolescence. So we don't really know, and there's some evidence that maybe even in utero exposures may be important in later life Parkinson's. So we don't exactly know the onset. If we don't know the onset of disease, studying exposures that cause the onset is very, very hard, right? If you don't know when that started, how do you know when to look for exposure? So this will come important uh, on how we conduct our studies. Briefly, for each one of these, um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia is by far the most common type of dementia. And I can bet that all of you know at least one person, unfortunately, that has Alzheimer's, probably more. Uh, it's a progressive disease. Uh, it's a very slowly progressive disease. It actually takes many years to progress. Uh, it involves parts of the brain that control thought, memory, and language. 
And it can really, uh, especially the more it progresses, seriously affect someone's ability to carry out daily activities. It's, as I said, extremely common. More than 10% of people above 65 develop these days um, Alzheimer's. For all of these diseases, as life expectancy is going up and as we are growing, they're becoming more and more prevalent as well. So this is an increasing problem, also a societal problem. Alzheimer's specifically tend to affect women more than men. About two out of three people diagnosed with Alzheimer's are women. Parkinson's disease is the second most neurodegenerative disorder. Maybe you know someone, most likely you know someone with Parkinson's, but not as likely as someone with Alzheimer's. Uh, it causes unintended or uncontrollable movements. And here in this graph, you can see some of the Alzheimer's, uh, sorry, Parkinson's symptoms. Um, it also involves parts of the brain that control thought, memory, and language, and also the systems generally develop slow over many, many years. Uh, but it's, it's not as common as Alzheimer's. In the U.S., about 90,000 cases uh, per year are, receive a new diagnosis. The population of the United States is about 330 million, just for, for reference. And it affects men more than uh, women in this case. And finally, we'll be talking about ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease because of a famous baseball player that wasn't famous to me because I don't know anything about baseball, but who developed the disease and his name was Lou Gehrig. So it's a very, it's, it's very rare. It's still the most common modern neuron disease, but it's very rare. Uh, in, and it's rapid, rapidly fatal. And by rapidly fatal, I mean that from diagnosis, most people unfortunately die within two to five years. Um, it's, it's progressive, but much more quickly, uh, progressive degeneration of nerve cells in the spinal cord and brain. And contrary to Parkinson's and ALS that involve parts of the brain that control thought and memory, ALS does not, which means you have full consciousness of what's happening in your body. So it's really a devastating, devastating disease. It affects voluntary control of arms and legs, and it can lead to trouble breathing because it's again muscles and we need muscles to breathe. Um, and the incidence is about four to six uh, new cases per 100,000. And it's uh, similar for men and women, ALS. So disease onset versus aggravation. I, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the onset of disease is unknown. We don't know when it exactly started. And um, we can look at symptom onset, which is different than disease onset or diagnosis. And to do that, we, will need, we would need well-characterized data. So we could use cohort data with accurate diagnosis. These cohorts tend to be small for Alzheimer's, not so much because now it's very common. But if we're going, you know, back in time, uh, you know, finding these data is not that that easy. And if if these studies are small, we have limited statistical power to detect associations. Now, the very interesting thing with air pollution is that the effect sizes are actually small. So the probability that exposure to air pollution will lead to um, an adverse health outcome in each one of us is quite small, the individual probability. Why is it such a huge problem? It's such a huge problem because the exposure prevalence is ubiquitous. We all breathe pretty polluted right now air, according to my, ah, today the levels are not healthy, so okay. But usually the levels are, are unhealthy in Barcelona, but in general, air pollution is, um, we all breathe. So even though each person has a small probability of having an adverse reaction to that exposure. If you take that to everyone, the numbers of cases actually are pretty, pretty high. So it's very important to characterize the effects of air pollution, but we need a lot of statistical power. We need numbers of participants in our studies. So cohort data for these diseases, especially something as rare as ALS, not great. So what we've been doing in my group is we've been leveraging administrative data, so hospitalizations to assess disease aggravation, not onset. As I said, we cannot look at onset and especially not with administrative data, onset of disease. And in administrative data, we cannot even look at onset of symptoms. We would need to have doctors, records, um, natural, nature, language processing, et cetera. We haven't, that's in the to-do list. We haven't done that yet. 
But looking at the incidence of first hospitalization for any of these diseases could capture that the cases are crossing to a more severe state of the disease. So we don't know when the disease started, but we know that at some point something happened that the case developed for the first time clinical symptoms is severe enough to require hospitalization. So the question that we have for all the studies that I'll show is, is air pollution linked to that point that a case becomes severe enough to require hospitalization? And this is a surrogate for disease aggravation. So the first study now a few years back that we published uh, was looking at air pollution and neurological hospital admissions in 50 cities across the Northeastern United States. Most of the studies are in the United States uh, that I will be presenting. Uh, we were looking at PM2.5 and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. This is now an old enough study that we did not at that point yet have good spatiotemporal model predictions for PM2.5 concentrations. So we had to restrict our analysis to cities with monitoring data. That's why it's just cities. Um, we used Medicare data. Medicare is, insurance is not great in the United States, but at least we have Medicare. Medicare uh, is one of the two public uh, insurances in the US. Everybody who is a get permanent resident or a citizen. So as soon as they turn 65, they're eligible for Medicare. So everybody, it basically includes everybody above 65. So it's a great um, data set for that limitation that we don't have information on people if they were, you know, when they were younger than 65. So the question here, the first question was, was long-term and by long-term we mean annual PM2.5 exposure associated with the disease aggravation for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Uh, in total, we have all, had almost 10 million subjects in this study. So we didn't have numbers. Uh, on average, they were 77 years old. Most of them were women, most of them were white. You can see that we had a good number of cases, more than 250K Alzheimer's cases, about a 20, 120K Parkinson's disease cases. And now the PM2.5 was 12 micrograms per cubic meter, one, because this was in, you know, <laughs> earlier um, in, in calendar time, but also it was mostly cities. So 12 at the point was also the national standard for annual PM2.5 in the US. And as you can see, we did observe uh, highly statistically significant estimates. This, these two numbers here means that per one uh, microgram per cubic meter increase in annual PM2.5, the probability of showing up at the hospital for the first time with Alzheimer's was increased 15% and 8% for uh, Parkinson's disease. So this is the first actually evidence that we have uh, that, that air pollution, PM2.5 specifically, um, can result in disease aggravation for these two outcomes. And we conducted a ton of sensitivity analysis and these results were, were pretty robust actually. So fast forward a few years that we now have access to pretty nice spatiotemporal models uh, that allows us, that allows us uh, estimation of exposures throughout the United States. So we said, okay, let's repeat to see if what we found holds. So now this, this graphs here is so, and uh, this is the, this study was 2000, 2016. So this is the average PM2.5 concentration over those 17 years. These are the rates of Parkinson's in the middle and the bottom, the rates of Alzheimer's disease per 100,000 cases. So we now, we now had more than 63 million Medicare enrollees. This is a massive, massive study. We could really use your supercomputer here, actually. Uh, this is a nationwide study. Uh, we had information at the zip code level of Medicare enrollees. We don't know the exact addresses. So exposure was, even though the model from now on, all the models I talk about predicted one kilometer grid concentrations, uh, grid resolution, sorry. So we aggregated those to uh, zip code averages. We identified over this time, one million Parkinson's cases, 3.5, 3.4 million Alzheimer's cases. And in this study period, and now also included rural locations, the uh, PM2.5 concentration average, annual PM2.5 concentration was 9.7 micrograms per cubic meter. I'm saying these numbers because they are important for um, regulations and standards. And with the exception of the first study, all other studies 
had concentrations of PM2.5 much lower than the US standard. Not than the current WHO guidelines that it's five micrograms per cubic meter for, for a year. We still haven't gone lower than that in the US, but definitely than the 12 microgram per cubic meter standard that was up until this January, Jaime, when was it? Very recently. And um, now it's even 10 to nine. They're thinking to reducing it. So even this is lower than potentially current standards. So this is a busy plot. I'll, I'll walk you through it. On the top are the results for Parkinson's disease. On the bottom are the results for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and on the y-axis is the hazard ratio, or you can think of it as the excess probability um, of uh, getting um, the first admission for these outcomes. Uh, because it's a ratio, the one here, this horizontal line means no effect. Everything above that line means air pollution harmful. Everything below that line means air pollution protective. So this last, last, last uh, point here, this is the overall in the entire population of Medicare. So you see that both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, we see, we, you know, see the same thing as we did in the previous study. We see per one microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2, annual PM2.5 concentrations. We have about, I think one is 13% increase and the other one is 14% increase or something like that. Um, increase in probability of being admitted uh, for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. But we also, because we had a ton of statistical power, looked at differences by subgroups. So the first one is men versus women. And we see that for both diseases, we see higher effect estimates for women, which means that air pollution seems to be worse for women than men based on this study. We did not see a difference in age because here we split age to 80 years, because again, as I said, we have everybody's above 65. So we did not see a difference by age when we dichotomize age to 80 years. Highest effect estimates among whites. Um, it was very interesting to see that it was lower for uh, black Medicare enrollees. And there are different reasons for these. Uh, one is that uh, black people in the US have a much lower life expectancy. So that's a competing risk. If you die before you have the opportunity of developing Alzheimer's, then you don't show up in the, you know, you cannot have. <laughs> Exactly. Um, also, there are issues with you know access to healthcare or how doctors treat because structural racism. So this is not necessarily something biological that we're picking up. It's, it's probably something systemic. Um, we did not see dual and non-dual means um, eligibility for Medicaid, which is the other public insurance in the United States for um, low-income Americans. Uh, so if you have a dual eligibility is an indicator of lower socioeconomic status. Um, but again, uh, same issues apply here, poorer people, lower life expectancy issues with accessibility. So maybe that's why we don't see anything here. Uh, but also what's very interesting is that we saw density here is in population density as a surrogate for urbanicity. So we see larger effect estimates, the denser the location goes almost no estimate, no effects at rural locations and in urban locations, that's where we see most of it. And that can, again, either indicate something about access or something about diagnosis, how easily a doctor's diagnosis, or it can also indicate something about the toxicity of the mixture. PM2.5, as I said, is a mixture, different components in rural locations versus in cities where there's much higher contributions for traffic, et cetera. So we, um, all these were interesting, but we wanted to repeat this in a, uh, in a place where we're not restic restricted only to people above 65. And we had the opportunity to do this in New York state. Now we're limiting our space uh, resolution or you know, coverage, but through New York's Department of Health statewide planning and research cooperative system, I can never remember this by heart, but Sparks, um, we have access to almost all hospitalizations in the states for all ages and independent of uh, insurance status, which is fantastic. And we, the only thing we don't have is federally operated um, hospitals, which means veterans affairs, basically. So we have about 98% of all hospitalizations in the states. 
Um, this study was conducted from 2000 to 2014. Unfortunately, we only had county level outcome information. So this is um, a bit larger aggregation, uh, but we still had a good representation for both um, Alzheimer's disease cases and Parkinson's disease cases. I, on purpose, because I want to talk about a lot of things, do not talk about the statistical models that we're using for the analysis, but if you have any questions, let me know and I'm happy to answer afterwards. Um, and, and as you see, in New York State, we actually have pretty clean air. Our, our uh, PM 2.5 is quite low. Um, and it's been going down both in concentration, but also it's becoming less variable over time. And these are the results for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. For both of these, we detected nonlinear associations. Now, another busy uh, plot on the x-axis in this case is the are the concentrations of PM2.5. These histograms in light blue at the back are for the PM2.5 concentration. So in both plots, they are identical because it's the same exposures. Uh, and you see that almost all of the PM is below 11 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. And um, for Alzheimer's at the top, again, at one is null. The dotted line, horizontal lines mean, means no association if the confidence interval cross that. So for Alzheimer's disease, we it's, it's a, more of a mixed signal in this case. Uh, there seems something to be happening at this specific range, but you know, Otherwise, there are not much in this study for Alzheimer's, but we definitely see a very clear uh, signal for Parkinson's disease as well. So we were also able to look at ALS, but it was all linear. So this now graph requires even some more <laughs> interpretation. So if you have a linear association, that means that the effect is constant across the range of the, of the distribution of the exposure. So when you say per one unit increase, it doesn't matter if you're going from four to five or from 14 to 15, the relative change in the outcome will be the same. But if you have a nonlinear association now, you can no longer have a per one unit increase. So the way to show the, the results is either you show a figure or you choose specific segments and say what's the effect estimate comparing those segments. So 8.1 was the mean in our study. 5.8 is one standard deviation below the mean and 10.4 is one standard deviation above that mean. So that's why you can see that and the main estimate, right? So this for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's is what was what I just showed you. It's a different way of presenting the same results that I showed in the previous slide. But for ALS, uh, ALS sorry, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, it was a linear association, statistically significant. So this is the first time we are showing an air pollution effect on ALS aggravation. Uh, we did not detect uh, differences uh, by sex in this study. Uh, also, we did not take differences by, and because we had all ages, now we could uh, dichotomize at 70 years, the age. We did not detect age differences for AD, but we did find stronger associations among younger, less than 70 years old, uh, New York State residents for both Parkinson's and ALS. Um, and we got a weirder signal for central metro, super urban, and going towards rural. So this is not as clear as in the previous study with uh, you know, urbanicity and density. So this, this may mean something, I don't know, um, not, not super clear, uh, but still for Parkinson's, again, strongest effect estimates and statistically significant was only for, for the urban core, which is probably just New York City, I guess, in this case. Uh, what's important here that I did not mention, for all of this, we had admissions, which means we have the primary code of admissions and up to 20 codes. So we assumed someone was a case if they had a related diagnostic code in any position, not only the primary position. So for Alzheimer's, actually, the Alzheimer's code was in the primary position only 10% of the time. 
Most of people for Alzheimer's and for Parkinson's is similar. We're admitted for cardiovascular disease, whereas for ALS, almost all of them were for ALS, the primary code. So the question is, okay, we know air pollution causes cardiovascular disease. Are we just picking the association with cardiovascular disease here? So we conducted sensitivity analysis, as one does, um, to only restricting analysis to if these were in the primary diagnostic position. Uh, Alzheimer's was not as consistent, depending on the sensitivity analysis, actually the Alzheimer's results either, either became too strong or not at all. But Alzheimer's has a lot of misclassification with dementia. Is it Alzheimer's? Is it a different dementia? So, but for the Parkinson's and ALS, the results were super, super robust. So then we said, okay, this is for, um, ooh, okay. Um, we might need to skip the ALS in Denmark, um, talking too much. So uh, PM2.5, as I said, is a whole mixture, but uh, not all particles are created equal. So we wanted to look more into PM2.5 components. So um, we teamed up with Randall, Mar Randall Martin, who is a, a, a phenomenal atmospheric chemist and has made publicly available high resolution spatiotemporal predictions for the main contributors to PM2.5 total mass. So PM2.5 is the exact same graph that I showed you earlier. This is also all in New York State using Sparks data, but we also now looked at organic matter, black carbon, nitrate. Organic matter, most of it is organic carbon, but not all of it. It has other organic stuff as well. Nitrate, sulfate, sea salt, and soil. So these are our results. These, all these things are correlated with each other, which means single pollutant models, one component at a time included in the model. If these are correlated and I see something with sulfate, let's say it's very correlated with organic matter, I don't know if that's for sulfate or for organic matter. So that's why we are also including a multi-pollutant model, including all of them together so we get independent associations. So we trust the orange um, effect estimates more. So we saw a big association with nitrates. Nitrates are commonly associated with agriculture, but New York State is not a particularly agricultural state. But nitrates can also come out of tailpipes exhaust, right? So in, in, in New York State, in fact, there are many uh, papers showing that nitrates are predominantly due to traffic. Now, why are we seeing an association with traffic and organic matter? Organic matter has a very big contribution of secondary organics, uh, but the primary ones are again, mostly from combustion and in urban settings is mostly traffic. Uh, why we see associations with nitrate and organic matter and not black carbon, in fact, black carbon shows protective here was a bit puzzling. Uh, so then we looked at nonlinearities. Everything else was linear except black carbon and sulfate. So, and, I, and as I said, we trust multi-pollutant models more than single pollutant models. Sulfate, nothing there. But for black carbon, the, the negative part, there's nothing there. The negativity in it comes from the very, very high end. So probably an outlier, probably Manhattan. I'm going to guess that it's driving this association down. So. I don't think we, there is really an association, but maybe some outlier. And people, you know, in Manhattan are probably different than people in, in, in the north of the state. So this, this may require either there is some model error, because we cannot assume that these predicted concentrations are true. So there might be some correlation with how well the model predicts in, in you know, Manhattan versus uh, other places, or uh, this may need some more uh, looking into it. And we also did the same thing for ALS. And again, we saw that organic matter, uh, and in this case, sea salt, uh, were um, big predictors of uh, ALS aggravation. Soil is mostly dust. Do we really think that soil is protective? It probably also means that if the PM2.5, um, you know, if a big contribution to PM2.5, if a big contribution to PM 2.5 months concentration is due to soil that is non-anthropogenic, it's just sand blowing, right? It might mean that the other toxic parts are lower in concentration. So maybe this is showing that 
it's protective because the toxic components are, are actually lower. Uh, very quickly, we also saw association. We conducted a study in Denmark. Denmark has a very different health system. Amazing. We, that's only ALS. Uh, we did a case control study. That's a very different study design. But we had a much better, uh, it's again hospitalization, but in this case, we were able to validate medical records. So we were able to look at traffic. In this case, we were focusing on traffic, and we also had traffic-related gases, NOx and CO. And it looks like most of the association is um, driven by elemental carbon. Why? It's a interesting thing here, elemental carbon is a combustion product, yes, mostly associated with diesel exhaust. And there's a lot more diesel exhaust in Europe than in the US, which may explain the discrepancy with the ALS results here with elemental carbon versus black carbon in the in in the states and finally we wanted to see the critical window when is exposure most relevant for the first admission for ALS skipping this part ask me if you have more questions I want to leave more questions towards the end and we saw that it's the more proximal exposures that are lag one is a year before the first admission that seem to be more relevant so it's not like you were exposed for a while, 10 years back, and then your first admission happened, but it, it's more the three years before your first admissions that seem to be more important. So with that, in conclusion, we consistently, no matter how, <laughs> how we do our studies, uh, see that total PM2.5 mass concentration is associated with accelerated clinical aggravation of annual degenerative disorders, even at PM2.5 concentrations that are much, much lower than the current US national standards, even than the proposed new standards. Composition likely plays a role, uh, which is important because it can have implications for maximally efficient regulations, but the signals we got were not that consistent across studies, so we may need more, to, more studies to look into this. Uh, more proximal exposures seem more relevant for ALS aggravation. Of course, we had a ton of outcomes classification. These are, you know, a doctor, it's, we did not validate most of this. It's impossible to validate. We assume that if someone had an Alzheimer's or Parkinson's related diagnosis, they probably have the disease. We also don't know if the one, if that was indeed their first one, or in the first one, the doctor did not include the diagnosis if they went in because they, you know, they broke a leg, for example. But did they break a leg because of Parkinson's? Maybe. So there's a lot of outcomes classification. And definitely we use prediction models for assessing exposures. These are not true, these are predictions. So there's definitely exposure measurement error. To the extent that the exposure measurement error is not associated with the outcome, and the outcomes classification is not associated with the exposures, both of these errors should bias towards the null, which means that the true effect estimates are likely even larger than the ones that we um, characterized and detected. Uh, and with that, I would just like to thank all these wonderful people because they are doing all the work. I'm just coming to present it. Um, you may recognize Jaime here, and I want to Definitely um, say that the, Janelli here, uh, most of the studies that I presented are part of her doctoral thesis uh, and the uh, traffic one and ALS, uh, Robbie led, uh, led that one. But uh, they, they, you know, they make this fun and uh, make me want to go to work every day. Uh, so with that, um, I think I'll stop now and let me i'm happy to go back to the things that are super rushed or talk about any questions you may have thanks a lot Marianne, for your really really interesting uh, presentation so uh, now we have uh, plenty of time for a uh, question discussion uh, if you're interested in the topic i don't know who wants to start also people online Carlos, you want oh, to start? Right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I didn't get, um, how, how do you calculate the aggravation? So from the first moment they go to the hospital and there, what is the proxy for aggravation? Yes, oh, uh, a very quick, sorry, comment first. 
uh, online people also feel free to, if you don't want to talk, feel free to talk, but also uh, type in the chat questions if you have any. So we didn't look, that's the next step we're finding. So right now we said, when is the first time they show up in the hospital? That date. So that day is the outcome for us. And we just see an, an the air pollution exposure before that, the year before. So effectively what we did for all these studies was we saw how many people in 2020 were admitted for the first time for Parkinson's. And we also saw uh, 2020 in this example, PM2.5 concentration and 2019 PM2.5 concentration. And we did that for multiple years. So the question was, considering confounders, because we adjusted for a ton of stuff, given all of this out of the model, out of the question, do years with higher pollution levels result to more first time hospitalizations for these outcomes? But the next step, what we want to do eventually is to also look at whether exposure makes you have more frequent hospitalization later. So then the outcome would be multivariate in this case. It would be the timing to next uh, hospitalization, but we haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then the, the, now that you talk about confounding factors, um, so I was puzzled by this result in what you have. Like, uh, you know, it seems that, you know, for the same levels, potentially same levels of, um, of PM2.5, um, in rural areas where intensity of population is low you don't have an effect so that doesn't uh, indicate partly that there may be confounders additional confounders in cities that may be triggering also like the you know like the so and i was asking what kind of confounders do you take into account in these studies so different studies different confounders just because of the study design so in the in the ALS, the last ones that were at the individual level, we looked at um, both individual and neighborhood level socioeconomic factors, uh, marital status, uh, time trends, uh, long-term potential time trends, because they're associated both with uh, outcome and disease, um, occupation, etc. For all the studies with the administrative data in the United States, we did not have access to any of those individual level factors other than age, sex, and race ethnicity. Uh, so we adjusted for those, and then we adjusted for neighborhood level socioeconomic factors. Now you may say, well, what about smoking or what about obesity? These are, for some of these outcomes, very strong predictors. However, because of the way we assign exposure, we don't have personal exposure. We only have the predicted exposure outside someone's, right? So whether I smoke or my weight does not, is, does not affect the confounder needs to precede exposure. So whether I smoke or whether I'm obese, it does not predict my concentration outdoors. The only way it does that is through neighborhood level SES, not even individual level SES. So we adjusted for neighborhood level SES. If we had information for individual level smoking and obesity, it, it may have resulted in a better SES adjustment, but it's not, but but I don't think it would make much of a difference, actually, because we have we adjusted for as many neighborhood level factors as we could for neighborhood level SES. Um, it's possible that the confounding structure is different in the rural locations versus, uh, but because we stratified the models that does allow for a different functional form between confounders and outcome in rural. So these are not interactions, these are stratified models. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very interesting result because I mean, you just think that, um, that there are some factors also that happen in cities that are necessary in order to have an effect of pollution as well, right? Yes. You know, I'm thinking about stress or I'm thinking about I exactly. don't know, like, uh, whatever, like anything that maybe correlates with density, right? Or something like that. You're absolutely right, yes. But also this assumes that the model, the prediction model performs the same 
in urban location versus rural location, which we know is not the same because 4 p.m. 2.5 monitors in the United States want to characterize population exposure. So there's a much higher density of monitoring locations than in rural, of monitoring sites in urban locations than rural locations. And these models are all trained, even though they provide full spatial temporal coverage, they all trained on monitoring sites. So in rural locations, we probably have much more error, which would drive the effect estimate lower as well. So, so that's why this all should be interpreted with all those, what you said, you know, all of these in, 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 in mind. Right. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. So the, I understood from the last comment that you made that the air quality model concentrations that you use as, a, as an input are also corrected using observational data, so you do data fusion. Um, some, it depends on the model. So the, this model here is not data fusion necessarily. It's actually trained. So this is a machine learning model algorithm that's an ensemble of, do you remember? So it's a, a random forest. It's a deep network and something else that I don't remember. It's an ensemble. So you you at monitoring locations you use the concentration that was added read in the instrument as the dependent variable and then all the predictors and they have aod as well uh, from remote sensing and land use variables and met variables so you use these to predict what the concentration is so you build the model that way and then you use the right hand side of the equation to predict everywhere else so this is how they did these models were built then the ones we used here in new york state these are more fusion, as you said, geographically weighted uh, with um, the monitor monitoring readings and AOD readings and geoscam uh, predictions. Um, and how, what's, what's the sensibility of your statistical models to changes in this concentration? So because we, we usually, we, in some projects, we are providing air quality outputs mm -hmm. yes. who have uh, infrastructure studies. And what's the sensitivity of the statistical models that we use? And suddenly we, I don't know, improve a bit, you know, our modeling results, and suddenly we are capable of, you know, reaching one more microgram to each meter in this region. That's an excellent question. So, and and actually, a, a whole other <laughs> the the BNE project depends exactly on that. So, these models, in theory, have an average very good predictive accuracy. Both of these models are, the cross-validated R squares are about 0.9. We, not for this, for cardiovascular disease and for daily, these are annual. So the 0.9 is for their daily predictions, their annual ones actually lower. But we did a study comparing different prediction models with similar, very similar prediction accuracies. And we got pretty different results. All of them harmful, but the actual effect estimate was different. And that is because we get these this global metrics of performance do not say anything about specific performance across space and time. So two models with equal performance may perform very differently summer versus winter or you know New York City versus Albany or Barcelona versus Madrid, right? And so um, depending on where the population in each study lives, what the outcome is, how the model predicts in space and time, we do see differences, you are right. So how sensitive it would depend on the model, on where the people live, on the outcome, on how the errors correlate with the outcome because that's that also comes into place right if 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 we have more diagnosis to begin with diagnosis rates of diagnosis not in absolute numbers but if we have larger diagnosis in urban centers because of awareness because of you know a million things because of doctors being more right um and we also predict better in urban places that's clearly a a, a, a more you know important bias than if the error is completely random. So, so you're right, the, these results are, are sensitive. And that's why we're trying to do things with different models and different locations to see was the, you know, how, 
does this hold? Do we actually believe these results or not? Yeah. My question. In the, in the study about the P and the composition, we are seeing that lipids are important for Yes, uh, for Parkinson's. All come from notes and uh, acid formation, and then lipid formation with the particles. Or so that's a good question. So yes, these are condensed phase uh, nitrates to begin with, um, and that's the the model that goes back to the model. The model is uh, using remote sensing for total PM2.5, so ALD, um, aerosol optical depth. It's using GeoSchem, uh, that is, um, are you familiar with GeoSchem? Okay, it's a regional, well not, it's an air quality model that takes into account meteorology and chemistry. So it uses predictions from GeoSchem. Um, it use, it's fused, fused with um, ground measurements, truth. Um, yeah, I don't think this model use, no, this model doesn't use land use uh, data. So, and we have concentrations. So we don't exactly know in each location, well, we could, but we didn't go back to check in each location what seemed to be the strongest contributor of the things you said to the nitrates condensed phase concentrations. Um, but other studies, Assuming that these concentrations, predicted concentrations are true, which is a big assumption so as we were just discussing, but assuming that these true, studies have shown that condensed phase nitrate concentrations in New York state are mostly from tailpipe emissions, exactly as you said. In the Western United States, completely different because most of it is agricultural. And, uh, but in the Denmark study, we didn't we did not. That is true. Or any effect, and if anything, it's negatively uh, correlated. This is a very different model. Um, this model, in fact, actually is, oh, I don't remember the spatial resolution. This is their air GIS model developed specifically for Denmark. Um, the spatial resolution, I think, is down to, I want to say 100 meters or 200 meters, something like that. It's not 1K as in the main analysis. Um, and here it was assigned to residential address. The previous one was a county, and a county is how large, like it's in half of Barcelona is a county maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a very large area, whereas here we had the prediction at the address. And also we don't have the relative comparisons of the errors. On average, both perform well, but uh, so, so yes, it is. And actually it was surprising because we would, we did assume we'll see something with Knox, um, but we didn't. And again, it's also the relative errors here in the predictions for elemental carbon versus Knox. Maybe the model, this specific model predicts much better elemental carbon than Knox. That's why I'm always hesitant. So I think Robbie, my postdoc who parks, who, who ran the study was talking about these results at some point. And a toxicologist asked him, so it's elemental carbon that it's the important component and not NOx, correct? And they're like, no, no, we cannot draw that conclusion, right? These are all predictions. And there's so many errors here that, you know, we don't really know what, what. But, um, but you are right, this is puzzling actually. I don't know if that answers the question because I interrupted you midway <laughs> and then just started talking, but I hope it does. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe so the, the answer is we don't know something in traffic seems to be important we're just not sure because also think that these are surrogates of traffic right but when we're thinking about traffic one is tailpipe emissions that it's not just these three things is a million other things and then you also have tire wear and brake wear and that's where all the metals are and we know from talk studies that metals are very important so these are just surrogates of traffic. We still don't know what exactly in traffic is the toxicologically relevant, important uh, component. Yeah. Oh, please go, go ahead. Uh, so in this case, you 
are correlating the particle matter with all the effects that we have. But you also have other gases for degrees, right? Carbon monoxide and carbon. We carbon. only in the Denmark study, this study only. Yeah. Yes, correct. So yes. Yes. And yes. You find like the one to one relation with particular matter concentration that works also, so that when you get a particular matter goes up, so you also know that. How do you separate out the effects between the gaseous for degrees and the particle? The particle coldness, yeah. yes. So these are, these were total PM2.5. Is actually not that correlated. It depends on how it's predicted with traffic in reality, because we found in studies that only about in urban center, only about 20% of the total PM2.5 mass is due to traffic. So that's not, that cannot induce a very high correlation. Um, but the way we did it here was uh, we included everything in one model. So that means that the effects for elemental carbon that we observe is given the NOx concentrations. So that's why it's important to not do things in separate models, because you're right, because of the correlations, there's no way to tell. But if you put things in the same model, and if they're not too correlated and you have a lot of statistical power, so it can absorb the correlation because otherwise your model will blow up. Um, that's not a technical term. It will not actually blow up. <laughs> but uh, sorry. Uh, but uh, that's why it's important, yes, to get independent associates. So also that makes interpretation a little bit trickier here because what's the elemental carbon association given NOx? And potentially they are capturing different parts, one different parts of traffic to begin with, but potentially different combustion sources altogether. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Parkinson's and ALS were in New York State, and we we did in the beginning the this analysis here. It had all three, but because the results for Alzheimer's in New York State were not particularly consistent, then for the composition we only focused on Parkinson's and ALS that were more consistent. In Denmark, we only did ALS, exactly, yes. Um, yes. If you have the variation for the benchmark, for the benchmark about, for example, primary or secondary, no, again, similar to we could, in theory, go back to our collaborators and ask, um, but we didn't. And about soil, what is the difference between the Parkinson's and the ALS that you found? Again, because we, you know, we're going to be here this morning. <laughs> so I had started running, yes. So um, we did not see anything for soil for Parkinson's. We saw a negative association with soil for ALS. Um, again, the, the solar results are a bit tricky. It could indicate either that different, either that soil does play a role or doesn't play a role. It could indicate, as I said, in the ALS part here, right? For ALS, soil was pretty consistently protective. So for ALS, it could indicate that maybe um, when soil is high, that means that other things that may be toxic to ALS are low. Maybe it, it also may mean that the soil errors, um, because the Parkinson's disease and disease rates and ALS disease rates are different across the state. So that's why also we're likely seeing different effect estimates. So it might indicate um, that the errors between outcomes classification and exposure mechanism and they're correlate in a different way for the two diseases. That's why the component results, those two studies were the first ones ever looking at this. So I would, before saying anything too concretely, I would like other studies <laughs> to see as well. Yes, um, yeah. Okay, any question online? 
Yeah, we have Hervé, please. Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have one question. Uh, here or in all these uncertain, uncertainty bars, uh, is there, are you including the uncertainty on the exposure, on the concentration, or, or is it something that is kept apart? Excellent question. No, we are assuming that the exposures are correct and fixed, um, but because you're right and all these are not fixed and they have both error and uncertainty, we are now, un unfortunately, most of the collaborators that we have do not really provide uncertainty estimates, spatiotemporal uncertainty estimates with these predictions. So maybe they will provide an overall uncertainty. Maybe they will provide, you know, by region or something like that. But in a different project that I'm not presenting now, um, we are developing new ensembling Bayesian ensembling algorithms um, to develop, uh, to maximize prediction is the first goal, but also get spatiotemporal uncertainties to the exact spatial and temporal resolution that we are using in each health study. And uh, we are conducting studies to see what happens if we ignore that versus what happens if we propagate that into the health models. So stay tuned. I will let you know when we do that. Okay. I have a, a second question. Like uh, in this, in all these papers, like you you are working at annual time scale, right? Yes, correct. And I was wondering if there is a difference if you have I don't know ten micrograms of PM two point five on average every day, every hour during the entire year, or if you have like very clean uh, moment and some some like uh, is there an accumulation of acute exposure exposure and how this inter in intra-annual variability impacts or could impact the, the results? Yes, so this is this is an excellent question. And this is again, one of the things to do in our list. We, so far, we have been looking at long-term exposure. So annual or calendar year going up, up to 10 years back, but you're right that it's, it, it is quite likely given of what we know about the um, biological responses right, that it's possible we do see in animal models that neuroinflammation can be pretty um, sensitive and, you know, happen much faster than a year. So that is uh, something that we do plan um, on looking in the future in like within a week exposures, do are they associated or do you actually need to have accumulated exposure over, over time? I'm sorry, I don't have the answers for any, to any of your questions, but they are very good questions. Thank you. So any, uh, we have another question, yeah. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. So when we're looking temperature specifically, when we're looking at, you know, annual exposures and annual average temperature, it's, you know, what does it even mean? Um, but we just, and by just, I mean, on Monday, <laughs> submitted a grant to exactly look at um, multiple climate relevant exposures, including temperature, but also temperature variability and air pollution and see shorter effects going to Hervé's questions as well, shorter effects on Alzheimer's specifically. So if we get the money, that's what we'll be doing next winter, hopefully. So yes, very good question. <laughs> so uh, any other question left uh, on the table? that you want to ask my auntie. If not, uh, yeah, I would. Oh, we have, uh, oh. Erwe, you have another question? Yeah, uh, an extra one. I was just curious, but for, yeah. for the London episode, yes. uh, do we know if it's mostly due to smoke or the SO2 levels? Or, or is there any information on this? Oh, and it's impossible to disentangle in this case, right? 
I think the way because it's it's it was and it wasn't just SO2, it was black carbon, it was it was everything. It was and also potentially the stress. You in the first photo, right? I, ah, sorry about that. It, it, the this the they couldn't the bus could not go someone had to walk right in front of it so the bus could carry people um so the stress was also also crazy and they were seeing people building you know and the hospital so it's so many things and because all of them happened together it's impossible to disentangle individual effects so the only way to do that would be in a you know very uh, well-designed experiment where, where you start introducing different things and exposing, well, you cannot expose people. It wouldn't be particularly ethical, but I guess um, some organism or animal and see what of it actually. Um, and it's probably a synergistic effect among, you know, between all of these things. As we have one hour for discussion left, uh, at least uh, we, we will continue discussion because I think that uh, that's, but feel free those that we yeah. will have, will like to go for lunch. Uh, so yeah. yeah. Emphasizing on this issue on, on composition, um, so what should be the future for you? Because I find it extremely complicated that this can, can really advance in the, in the near future, basically because if I understand correctly, like you mostly have spatial temporal observations uh, for integrated yeah, you have 0.5 AUV, but there are not many uh, observations, spatial temporal observations of composition. Uh, there are just few measurements of composition. Of course, you know they can be used to evaluate models, but, but definitely not everywhere, right? Um, so therefore, I mean, when you're correcting the PM, but you are proportionally correcting all the components at the same time. So if you had a 10% of nitrate in the original model over that day, you're going to have a 10%, even if the PM contract is going to increase or decrease because you constrain it with the OS. Um, so like, and, and that means that, you know, the, the you, you, you know, we even correcting these observations, we are kind of like, um, um, you know, propagating the structural error in the composition. Yes. How to evaluate that structural error in the composition, to what extent, and it will definitely finally depend on the underlying model, right? So how, how to move forward? Um, do you have thoughts? Uh, have you discussed about I have it? thoughts about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they're okay thoughts or not, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but yes, that's an excellent point, actually. And your questions are touching upon all my research areas, which is fantastic, I guess, because we couldn't talk about um, so it, it really depends on the research question. So is the research question to identify the most toxic components? That's, that would be a whole different answer. Is the research question to inform policy? Whole different answer. And a lot of what we do in the group is working with mixtures. This is a mixture, right? So high complex, high dimensional exposures with these types of errors and how we can account for those, how we can correct for those in the health statistical models. And my interest has always been, I am an engineer. I don't understand what's happening in, in inside our bodies. I should be embarrassed to say that, but I'm not really <laughs> given my, but um, so I don't, identifying the most toxic component, especially because of all these errors is not a particular interest to me. I think the only, good way to do that is through toxicological experimental studies, um, especially when it comes to components for total PM 2.5 NOx and ozone in the US, which is one of the densest um, monitoring networks in the world. We have about a thousand more than thousand monitors now for composition across the entire United States, we have about a hundred. So it's important, it, the errors there. So, and I don't think hopefully eventually we'll be at the point they're talking about using different spectres, not just AOD to correct and blah, 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 and geoscam. But I don't know when we will be there to have good enough predictions or good enough estimates of the predictive accuracy. We don't even know that, right? 
Um, so my personal interest, I'm not saying that this is what people should be doing. My personal interest is in looking at sources. So I don't know if we can predict better elemental carbon or NOx or nitrate, but I do know that we can regulate traffic. What in traffic? Toxicologists can figure it out for now. So can I get at least a good estimate of traffic? Can I get a good estimate of coal combustion? Can I get a good estimate of you know different sources? So that's why the nitrate, I don't attribute the, like the NOx and nitrate discussion, and EC discussion we were having earlier. I don't think it's the NOx versus EC, right? I, I think these are indicators for certain sources and, and, and that's where I'm, 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 I'm going. So we are developing, um, Jaime is working a, a lot on this as well. Uh, we're working with computer scientists to develop, uh, to improve pattern, exposure pattern recognition algorithms so we can better identify exposure to specific sources, patterns of exposure. And then hopefully those results can be more informative to regulators. Um, but that, again, that's not, there's no right or wrong way here, right? That's my personal, you know, what I can understand and what's my interest. Super. Ah, thanks, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so you're talking a lot about computer sources, right? But there are a lot of technological advances that are, 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 are introducing a reduction of these emissions yes for transport by industry and so on and before you were showing um a plot where you can really see how pm 2.5 concentrations are decreasing a lot over time yeah but then you say and now it's like more of a tool right so then it means that that there are other sources that are much more important in relative terms which are much more tricky to understand like use of solvents or cooking fumes or think that the emissions have been basically constant because it's a uh, product use, right? People are eating every day, they are using the other end, but like every day, you know. <laughs> well, not luckily, a lot of chemicals in the other end, so not luckily necessarily, right? But yeah. And then it, it gets from all the perspective much more tricky to understand these things because A, in terms of emissions, the uncertainty is high. When you put these emissions in your model to get the secondary organic aerosol, which are dominating now, it's much more difficult. And from a policy making perspective, going back to the origin, then it's even much more complex, right? So yeah, how, how will we be able to handle that? And I'm thinking if the PM2.5 composition is changing over the time, do you see a relationship between these and changes in the type of healthy but Ethics in population. Can you can you say something about that? Excellent, excellent, excellent comment. And indeed, yes. In uh, as you were talking in LA, we now see that tra because traffic has been going down, we see solvents. Right, we are now picking very clear signals of uh, cleaning product use at homes at monitors. And in New York City, one of the biggest contributors now is combustion from cooking and restaurants, um, which is quite surprising. Like, okay, we've, we've dealt with traffic, now we stop eating. Uh, no, <laughs> we, we, we definitely don't stop eating. That's, that's, that's relatively new. So if you look here, where am I? Right, so this all starts happening after 2009. So this is all very relative. We don't have good enough data yet. Uh, to characterize, to, un to even understand those exposures. The, when did they, sorry, I keep looking at Jaime because I have the worst memory in the world, but I remember that I've seen things that we've, this is things that we've discussed in the group and he has a better memory than I do. But when we were discussing the cooking thing, that came up only two years ago, right? In New York City. Yeah. Something, yeah. They, they, they were saying that the contribution was about like 30 to 50%, something like that. Like, it's so a, impressive. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, in the European yeah, national emission inventory, this source is not considered. It's not considered. Yet, because exactly, because it, it yeah. only became relevant very recently when everything else started going down. Then it was already relevant yeah. right? because it was a background that was not there. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But I mean, if it's 1%, if it was 1%, and now it's becoming 30%. Right. Um, so, 
we need more data is the answer, but also for the health data, there's always a lag. Right now, we can at best have health data up until 2018. Our exposure models also go only go up to 2018. So we the steps we need to is one, figure out how to model this better and get some specific moral distribution for these sources. Hard to begin with. Model this, get more recent data, start looking into this. So I think the way for that is to start with some pilot, smaller pilot studies, see if there's something there and start building from there. But you're right, these, these things will start becoming more increasingly more important. And these are somewhat small, you know, concentrations. The contributions are increasing, but in absolute terms, the concentrations are small. But we also have definitely the US, but also in Southern Europe, wildfires that are overwhelming. So it's it's really everything is changing and weather patterns are changing. So it means the secondary formation is also changing, right? So so we will need as these things become different, we will need to figure out a way to better adjust and more quickly adjust our models to capture new things as they come out. How we do that? That's your job, I think, here, right? And then you give me the, the data. <laughs> but the toxicological part is also important, right? Because do we know if the secondary organic aerosols that are formed from um, cooking, the, the film cooking, you know, it's, it's equally relevant as the one that comes from forest fires? Which we, we, we don't know, that. exactly. So maybe we put a lot of embers. But then we realize that okay, it's just, you know, we can we can continue opening restaurants, it's fine, you know. Absolutely. Or, yes, exactly. I mean, ultimately the, the part that's the combustion product, it's it's or, in both cases you burn stuff, you have incomplete combustion, right? So there are similarities when you're talking about combustion. The solvents, whole other yeah, story, right? Yeah. But still, what you're burning is is different. Um, how you you know you get the combustion. And the wildfires, it's not only trees, right? Now, as you start going into urban locations, then you really have no idea what you're burning. And it's all, you know. Yeah. So, so yes, it's 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 becoming well, super scary, but from a research point of view, very interesting. And I think the bottom line is that we need monitoring speciation for speciation, which means we need money. So I don't, the, <laughs> I don't know how we solve that part first. This is the first thing to solve. And then, you know, because if you have money and you can monitor all these, I can design, you can design, all of us can design perfect studies, great studies, but how do we monitor these is the... Uh... And one question about the sensitivity of all these results, for instance, the case of uh, New York versus Denmark. No, you mentioned that you work with different type of... Uh, uh, Air pollution data one at the kilometer resolution uh, another one was uh, it was hundreds of meters or, or be even below yes so what's the sensitivity of your final findings on on the on the level of aggregation or disaggregation of the inputs that you use no uh it's 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 linked with with the question of survey on on the intra-annual variability this yes is on the spatial spatial, uh, exactly. spatial variability that we have uh, is this relevant? Should we should we care a lot to provide really detailed information? Uh, if for instance, we we spend a lot of time in Barcelona. Well, let's try to, to provide new information on the city. Is this uh, worth, or you or or your studies have still a lot of uncertainty, and and you really don't need uh, a good representation of the gradients of uh, Valencia versus the two streets uh, next right. to Valencia where there's no car and, and concentrations are skewed yes. and dropping dramatically. But at the end, you do the analysis on the census level, on the county level or whatever level. <laughs> so what's the point? Exactly. Where, where should we as a, yes. as a air yes. quality uh, modelers uh, put, put the focus? Huh? That's a very good question. And I think it depends on so many. You're right. These are not mutually exclusive. The health parts have so many uncertainties anyway. That's, but it definitely depends on the pollutant. They have different heterogeneities. Mm -hmm. For PM2.5, total PM2.5, they are pretty homogeneous. We can be more relaxed. We don't necessarily need that address specific. Two streets over won't make much difference, right? For PM2.5, same for ozone. For traffic-related pollutants, they go down pretty quickly, right? So uh, actually, that's the thing that I didn't say for, where are we going this way? 
what is a county level average of black carbon? What does it even, you know, conceptually mean, right? We, Manhattan is one county and the distribution of black carbon in Manhattan is, is you know, from extremely high, one of the highest in, in, in the state to be quite low, right? So it, it depends on the pollutant is one. It depends on the population. Most of this population, not the New York State one, but the Medicare population is older people, mostly retired, they mostly stay at home, in which case a prediction at their house would be best. If I work and my, and, you know, my, my job is at the other side of the town, then having maybe an average is, is, is more relevant to capture my daily exposure. Or if you know, I have kids and I have to take them to the doctor and here and there, and I move around the city a lot. So it depends on many things. So I think it's, if we can, the finer we can get, it's better. And then we can aggregate depending on the usage. If we only have aggregated data, then it's harder to, to, to yeah, go, go down, yes. But are there uh, already some sensitivity studies uh, just, yeah, uh, quantifying the the impact of, of level of aggregation because, for instance, Denmark, you, you could you could uh, aggregate the, the the input data at the county at the at the I don't know at different levels and see where all the, your uh, signals are. Yes. Uh, so what's the variability on your final uh, results? No, and findings. Uh... Yes, yes, yes. There's there definitely makes a difference, and in, indeed the difference does vary by pollutants. So. There have been studies uh, showing, oh, and it also depends on the study, not the window of exposure that's relevant and the pollutant, because depending on the study design, for st some study designs, spatial contrasts are more relevant. Mm -hmm. For some study designs, temporal contrasts are more relevant. So if you want a daily time series, then, you just want, it's pretty okay to get the up and down of the day. It doesn't matter if, you know, here and here it has a different concentration. If on average they go, you know, up and down, that's what you care about. If in this case we want annual concentrations, then the spatial contrasts become more important, especially for traffic related pollutants. Um, there were, there have been some studies um, in around 2010 about measurements error. Um, definitely for PM 2.5 a lot, and we do see that with special temporal predictions, we see some improvement for sure. Uh, but even they've also shown, even for time series, if you can get better spatial resolution for PM 2.5 and you, for the more heterogeneous pollutants, you gain more. But but definitely there is there's error associated. So the better resolution you can have, the better it actually is. Um, mid sentence, I started having a thought about that, but now I lost it. Um, but yes, the, it definitely uh, makes a difference, and it's definitely good to have better resolution mm -hmm. for for some pollutants. As I said, total PM two point five, it doesn't. Right. County might be a bit large, but zip code PM 2.5, it's probably okay. Even zip code level uh, black carbon. My zip code now, I live in El Gotico and it goes from the sea to further in, mm -hmm. right? So it does, even there, it's like by the sea, you have a lot of winds, a lot of dilution. At the smaller streets, the, the pollution gets trapped, right? It, does, it cannot uh, be diluted so freely. So it does make a difference for sure. Mm -hmm. The ultra fine particle is something to tackle in most for health. Okay. Definitely ultra fines, especially for neurological health, but in general, uh, they are the ones that can penetrate penetrate the most. So the the, the studies, these are toxicological studies that I briefly mentioned um, in mice um, overdose over. Oberdoster maybe is his last name. A toxicologist at the University of Rochester um, looked at dissected brains of mice um, 2000, around 2010, I think. 
and actually detected metal particles. These are ultra fines because they can go directly to the brain. And we know metals are very bad for the brain. Most metals, not all of metals. Um, the problem with ultra fines and studies from Europe, because Europe has models for ultra fines. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So studies from Europe do show, and for ALS, our collaborators from the Netherlands um, looking at ALS, they, they have found association with ultra fines. The problem is again monitoring. There are no, there's no monitoring network, definitely not in the States for ultra fines. I don't think there is in Europe. Europe is happening. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, okay. Uh, they are deploying new. Yes. New okay. To it, uh, yes. Good. Uh, that's good. But there's some papers coming out now in this project. Are yeah, right. You're right. To check it all and others are working on this. So this is also challenging that. because uh, depending on the instrument uh, that they measure from uh, 40 nanometers, 90 nanometers, uh, again, uh, yes. you need to be yes. careful yes. how you, how you yeah. use the information. No? Yes, yes. And there's no, yeah, there's no standard yet. Uh, this is under yes. discussion in the, in the community. No? So, so yes, I, I do think they are very, very relevant and they can probably even translocate not only through the brain, but uh, uh, actually even from the lungs to the circulation, total circulation, and then go through the entire organs. They extremely scary. There is a team in Belgium that are looking at accumulation of black carbon black carbon the size distribution is very bimodal right okay so you have the larger black carbon but you also have black carbon in the ultra fine and they are looking at accumulation i don't know what method they're using at different organs and they've seen accumulation of black carbon nanoparticles in placentas in kidneys <laughs> so so we they are coming into our body uh, and they're sticking in these organs. The concentration? Um, I don't know if that would be a con would it be a concentration? Or like in mass, uh, right? Mass. Something, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, how much it goes. So that's a very good, I, I don't know. Um, it, that does not mean the papers don't say. <laughs> the papers may say. Um, I don't know. And also, I don't know how long it takes. Do I breathe it in and it's there in a minute? Probably not. But is it there in two days or, you know, or how much of it do I breathe? And I think it would be mass. It wouldn't be mass per volume. But let's say I, I breathe in in a day. I don't, I'll make this up. But let's say I breathe two total micrograms in black carbon. How much of it goes through my um, lungs into the circulation? And how much is it deposited where? And that also probably depends on individual level factors as well. And does it preferentially stick in certain organs versus others? All this is very new. It's a very new research. I think the first placenta paper came out. I saw the presentation. It was not the paper yet. I saw the presentation in the last meeting I went before COVID, so 2019. So this is very new technology that we can detect that, very recent. Um, so email me if you want and I can send you the papers, yeah. Mm -hmm. My email, I'll share the slides and my email is in the first, yeah. yeah. And what's your opinion about, uh, so, Air pollution or pollutant, we have uh, natural concentration, natural background now, and the, yes. the standards are going down, 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 and they are reaching close to what is what we could call natural yes. background. But we still, I get that uh, all these health studies uh, explains that the first microgram is already affecting no health. Correct. So what, what's your perspective here? Sometimes we're, it's it's a little bit uh, puzzling now. It, it's it's it, we we've been always exposed to that, or at least there's a natural environment. And uh, yeah, what's the perspective? Because uh, over 
the, the body, the, the way our bio biology should be already adapted uh, to cope with that, no? Some of it. I, I, I agree with you. Um, sorry, parenthesis. Not a big source, not big. It doesn't end up being big, but a source of NOx is lightning. And there was one thunderstorm. Were you already? I don't remember if you were already in New York. Um, it was a huge, not lightning storm in New York City. There were lightnings everywhere. So I told Je one of my doctoral students, Jenny, who had myocardial infarction data to look at whether we see increases because the NOx would have been, we didn't have measures of NOx, I don't remember, but the concentrations in theory should have gone way up mm -hmm. from all the lightning. Um, she didn't see anything, um, but but the, this is a very good question. And, and, and as I said, first of all, not all particles were created equal, and it's not just particles, it's the gases as well, right? Um, but think of, of, think of ozone formation. There's, there, ozone, especially back where ozone background is very important. It's impossible right. to, right? But then even if you have a lot of biogenic VOC, VOCs, it only takes a tiny bit of NOx, right? It doesn't take all that much if you have the VOCs there. Um, so, and, and, and the secondary formation for particles is, is similar. You need a little bit in the pot and then you throw the air and then they, uh, I think in general, we see that particles from anthropogenic sources or pollutants associated with anthropogenic sources tend to be worse, more toxic. Um, and yes, maybe, you know, condensed phase uh, biogenics were always somewhat harmful, but now you have all these other things on top of this. What also is not explicitly included in this equation is that it's not only air pollution, but it's our entire lifestyle is is yeah, so uh, exactly it's compounding effects. Uh, uh, yes, and and more stuff behind that. Yeah. Yes, so I think the things we can control, the things we can reduce, the better it is. We cannot control everything, um, but we can still reduce more at this phase. We're not at the point yet that it's economically impractical to reduce more. We can still reduce more. So um, when we are at the point that and that we cannot, you know, reduce more, then we'll talk. But the fact that certain industries do not want to invest in filters or in cleaner forms of energy. Yeah, that's not, uh, that's not, yes, uh, exactly. Not but I do think we can, we, can, we can still reduce more. And we, if we are at the point that all of it is just natural or most of it is natural, that's a very different discussion, but I don't think we're nearly anywhere there yet. So, yeah. I, I would say that you know, like the natural pollution before industrial revolution probably was not an evolutionary control because you know we were dying quite fast in the past, right? You know, like when we were hunter gatherers, we we're dying at 34 years old. So even if there's a, I mean, that was not controlling like you know evolution kind of. It was not strong enough, right? I guess um, um, to be you know. So we were kind of adapted to the kind of like lifetime that we had to that kind of pollution, right? Maybe, but it doesn't mean that wildfires, right? There were always wildfires. Sure. I'm pretty sure that it, they always, you know, caused something yeah, back then sure. as well. Yes, but it were those were potentially rare events, right? And but well, also maybe not. Maybe it was not exactly. Maybe not. I mean, industrial fires now they're being reevaluated, and you know, like apparently, like we thought that there were less fires today. You know. Oh yeah, because climate change, of course, yes, 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 they are increasing in in frequency and intensity because you have drier, you know, soils. And, um, yeah, but I say in the industrial now, the new estimates is that we had more fires than in present day because, like, by land use change, we have cut cut fires. Now it's increasing again. Ah, 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 ah I see. Okay, so I understand. Yes, yes, yes. By mass burning levels in the past were Where? higher than right. present day. Maybe, so, maybe. Yeah. Um, but when you said about cookings, I remember when I was in undergrad, I did my undergrad in Greece and they were looking, um, again, engineering, so nothing with health studies, but they were measuring, one of my professors there was measuring 
concentrations, particle total PM2.5 and black carbon concentrations in churches for all, from all the candles that are burning. And apparently priests in, um, at least in Greece, because I don't think elsewhere they burn so many candles as in Greece in churches, well, well, but uh, priests in Greece- Is it behind Greece? Or... <laughs> We I think a lot so, of uh, as well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> I, I don't know, um, I haven't done that uh, comparison well enough yet, robustly yet, but apparently um, certain disease rates among priests are much, much more common that have been associated with combat. Now, of course, their entire lifestyle is completely different than anyone else's, so I don't know how well generalizable these are, um, but yes, so if you had to warm up in the winter and you had, you know, you had to burn wood, what did you have? That was the only option. So I think that was also bad. I'm not, I don't yeah, think it's exactly. good, but also they potentially, you know, ventilation maybe was different, right? I don't know whether they could, you know, they were, I, I don't know how it was. No, there's then this indoor, outdoor uh, pollution. Yeah, exactly, topic, yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, and if that's the only source, it's still okay yeah. versus, you know, and they were all day in the clean air, you know, granted doing very hardcore manual agricultural work, but yeah. So, um, but the thing is, I guess a larger philosophical question, do we say, okay, so then we were always exposed. So, okay, sure we reduce a little bit or do we continue trying to improve and improve? And that's, you know, I think that's somewhat subjective where we stop. Well, of course, yeah. I think all of us would agree mm -hmm. to, to live in a cleaner city than in the middle of an industrial area. No? That's yes. That's for sure. That's yes. Right. But it's interesting on on this uh, relationship with these neurodegenerative the, the uh, pathologies or other type of of, of, uh, uh, of health issues. No, uh, how this has been changing through the the, the decades and. Uh, because again, it's pollution is one of the pieces, I guess, uh, and there are others. Uh, and I think also that's why the it's not only way. that they're going down, but that's why the variability is also becoming yeah. tighter. Because uh, yeah, exactly. Okay. Sorry, no, no, I don't uh, know. How do we start from electrification? The factory, because. We still have moving parts. We yes. have new materials that can form these uh, nanoparticles. Yes. So, multi level answer here. So, the first one is that if you have electric fires in cities, that will reduce the pollution in the cities. I think we can all agree to that. But where does the energy come from? who gets exposed, depending on where the energy comes from. If the energy still comes from coal pl power plants, then that means that someone is exposed to the plumes from those plants. Maybe not, I mean, does our power plants near Barcelona? Yeah. Yeah. But now they're not so much used because it's natural gas, but okay. in 10 years, they will be very much used. And one of them is for when the board is electrified and now it's not being used at all. Okay. So we'll end up with three very high emitting point sources in a few years. Exactly. Now. So because it's natural gas and they are shutting down yes. the whole part of our plants. Okay. Okay. So 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 that then <coughs> you don't have the pollution from the cars or that goes down, but you potentially if it's not um you know wind or solar you you have pollution at different locations. So also who has the electric cars, probably the richer neighborhoods, right? So you make this, you move this problem to potentially poorer populations. Um, that's one. You still have all the other side effects that are associated with car usage, as you said, right? Decreased physical activity, accidents, Maybe not so much noise because electric cars are not too noisy, but the yeah, no, yeah, they are and the honks. cars and they emit more non turbine So like the composition will change. It will probably, as you say, it will reduce, right? But you have like the more friction of the wheels because there's I mean they're more heavy the cars. So that's another component that it's uh, 
you will have the plastics from the um, yes the, yes uh, exactly uh, which is something super under I know I mean I recently you know like I didn't know about it and I just you know reviewed a project that you know wanted to look at the dust probability of like the particles coming out from the from the from the wheels mm -hmm. kind of because you know that's going to be a new component that is under study yes break yes tire and break wear yeah, yes exactly yeah. yes and and did I shared it this was it this morning or yesterday morning I was just reading a paper looking at air pollution concentrations in California because California is one of the places with the highest EV uh, numbers in <laughs> uh, exactly and indeed in rich neighborhoods air pollution levels have gone down but not in poorer neighborhoods so you are helping a part of the population that probably is a part of the little population that doesn't need as much the reduction, but you're not helping, and you may in fact be making it worse, depending on you know where all these materials end up. They will not end up in you know in our backyards, right? They are probably being shipped somewhere in Southeast Asia, and the batteries and and where the energy comes from, who gets exposed to that plumes. So, on the one hand, electric cars are better than you know non-electric cars but personal opinion i think the way this discussion going is like electric cars are the panas the you know all solution for everything and people don't discuss all the side effects of that and yes it's good to go towards that direction it's a step a good step but i think the assessments need to be more comprehensive uh, and should include all these components that you mentioned in 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 health effects uh, and and health impacts assessments. Yeah. Okay, those are quite quite uh, interesting and passionate discussions. <laughs> I think it's time for lunch. Uh, thank you a lot, uh, Mayanti, for your a really nice talk and uh, thank you i'm excited to be here those that want to thank join for, the uh, questions. for lunch uh, yeah. uh, do you put any mask yeah, so <laughs> just, <laughs> as a person for <laughs> suffering from allergies definitely for allergens like uh, pollen definitely <laughs> the years the two years that we were all masks that was there were the years that i did not sneeze almost at all it was fantastic yeah. but we do see so this will be very interesting for the health analysis. Um, yes, the masks, they're not perfect, right? But even if you just put your hands, it's not perfect, but it will reduce your exposure, yeah. right? Because all of these things hit on your, you, right? So the masks, they're not perfect. They will not completely reduce your exposure, but they do reduce, they will not eliminate your exposure, but they do reduce your exposure quite a bit. So, so yes, I think, I. But is it realistic to have everyone? I mean, we did it and we know how it felt. None of us particularly liked it constantly going around, especially if it's 40 degrees out, you know. And <laughs> so um, it does help, but I don't know that it's it's very in. Um, I teach in one of the classes, I guess, lecture uh, in the departments. I do the intro to air pollution class. And that's before COVID, before we were all wearing masks. And there is this um, company that started creating fashion masks for use in China because of their, their, their levels there. So they would have masks with, you know, very nice uh, patterns and colors. And, and so, so yeah, it, it definitely helps. What we all do, this does for biases in our studies, who chose to wear a mask, when, how? I have like, the fact that we don't have 2020 onwards health data so far is because I don't, I don't know how we deal with that in the model because that will be a lot of measurement error that depends on so many individual level factors and lifestyle choices and it's, exactly, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> Yeah. Huh? Probably, yeah. yeah. That's true. Okay. So well, let's close here.
I'll stop. Maybe stop sharing. Thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs>